Um, Alexa, play electric relaxation. Welcome, welcome. A track called Quest on Amazon Music. Hello, everybody. Hi. We're going to start converting you all to panelists so that you can join us on camera if you choose. So you're going to see your screen blip out for a sec and then you'll be back. So don't worry. We'll be back with you in just a second after we. Yes, I want to see everyone's smiling faces. I want to see you. It's brunch. After that, we'll get started. And I my, my little accoutrement here. My, my plate has its own camera view. That is a beautiful setup. Taylor, put your face. Hi. 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 Those are my parents. Hi. Those are my parents. <laughs> <laughs> Your daughter is a superstar. Yeah. 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 I'm good. Oh, this is so fun. Alexa, stop. I was playing some hip hop in the background. Hey, Jennifer. I see you waving. I see Kelly. Hey, Elizabeth. Oh, my goodness. Thank you guys so much for spending the first Sunday of the new year with us. Awesome. So many great pieces. All right, so you hear me in one and see me in the other because I made a, a camera view from my plate. Hey, Kelly, happy new year. Oh, hey, Carolyn. This is so fun. I'm so excited to see everyone. Yes, a Tribe Called Quest is playing in the background. I thought that we should start with a little classic hip hop ambiance, right? Um, welcome, welcome, welcome. We're going to get started in a few seconds. I just want to express my complete gratitude for you guys spending this hour with us on Sunday. We're going to have a ton of fun talking kava and caviar. Um, Erin, you will tell me when to start talking. Yeah. I can prepare this, this plate. Oh, goodness. So far, I think we've got almost everybody in and I will keep letting people in. So just from a technical side, we made everyone a panelist so that you can opt to be on camera. Um, you're gonna see some fun polls coming up during this call. And you of course are encouraged to use the chat box, but um, we wanted to be on a webinar format so that we could have the best view and the best shots, but it's so good to have all of you. Like Shakira said, we'll start in just another, we'll start in another one minute. So get comfortable. Don't wait to start drinking your wines. Um, if you have them, there's no reason to wait. And we'll talk about them a little bit later, of course, during the session. So we will be talking about the, all three Navarone Cavas. If you wanna choose an order to start in, we would recommend the Navarone Brut, then the Navarone Brut Nature, and then lastly, the Dama, but it doesn't really matter. It's brunch, this is a casual, this is a casual good time. So that being said, I think we will get started in a second and I'll just keep letting people in as they arrive. Um, use the chat box if anything comes up. And after that, I think we'll, we'll hand it over to our illustrious host, Shakira Jones, if you're ready. So fun, I am ready. Shall we start? All right, guys, well, welcome again. Happy 2021. The mere fact that we survived 2020 deserves uh, a bottle being popped right now, doesn't it? I am happy to see your smiling faces, happy and healthy. Welcome to this amazing event in partnership with Olio Brigado, Paramount Caviar and Hip Hop Ed. Um, for those of you that don't know me, welcome. My name is Shakira Jones. I am a wine writer and media personality based here in New York. Uh, I have a show on Som TV. I recently did a documentary called uh, Crush and I am a Spanish wine scholar candidate. So Erin and I have that in common that we are both studying right now for our Spanish wine scholar certifications. We are both truly passionate about the wines of Spain. And if you follow me on social, you know that I am equally, equally passionate about caviar and putting it on everything and sharing it with everyone. So just a couple of housekeeping bits about this. This is meant to be interactive. It is not a lecture from me. Um, it is meant to be interactive. There is no question that is strange, stupid, dumb, too elementary, too sophisticated. If I don't know the answer, I have no problems telling you I don't know. Uh, and I will look it up for you and make sure that we get it. So please feel free, um, just unmute yourself when you have a question. Please utilize the chat, chat with each other. If we say something or you see something that, that you have a question about but you don't wanna interrupt the, the flow of the conversation, that is why that chat box is there. You are free to um, 
to talk in there. And yeah, just ping us with any questions. All right, sounds good. So the reason we are all here today, we are benefiting one of my favorite nonprofits in the world. It's one that, I mean, it's a family business, really. Um, Hip Hop Ed, I don't know. We sent you guys a little bit of information about this organization, what it does, how impactful it is in bringing in students that are generally not welcomed or invited in the space of STEM education. And similarly, wine and caviar have been two things that have kind of been exclusive and not necessarily the most welcoming of things either. So we saw a parallel there and an opportunity to really introduce all three things to you and get you excited about them. We have Hip Hop Ed's founder, Dr. Christopher Emden on here. Chris, why don't you tell us a little bit about Hip Hop Ed? Uh, hey, Shakira, and hey, everyone. So glad to see all your wonderful faces. Um, Hip Hop Ed is a nonprofit organization that's about a decade old. And our work is really existing at the intersections of education and hip hop. We found, I'm a scientist by training, and I found in my work in classrooms, young folks, particularly young folks of color in urban spaces, have been completely disengaged from success in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And we all know that those fields are the fields where they are the um, immense amount of jobs, immense amount of opportunity, and it's just perceived as not being accessible. And so a decade ago, I realized that young folks were engaged in and with hip hop, and I found some connections between hip hop and science. And so we started an initiative called Science Genius, where we went to schools across the country, had young folks write raps around science content, but it had to be science content that they were learning in their classrooms. And what we found was the same young folks who were disengaged and not not participating, not doing well, all of a sudden found an entry point in. And we utilized that as a leveraging point to get them to declare science majors, to go into college and university and graduate with science um, degrees, to want to be science educators and math educators and technology educators. And so it's just leveraging the power of hip hop to engage young folks in education, particularly in STEM. And Shakira has been a part of our conference. We do a, a conference every year for educators to learn ways to sort of expand their ways of connecting with young folks. And as Shakira mentioned, you know, Science like wine uh, is perceived to be out of reach and not being able to be connected to. And folks feel as though, you know, I'm not part of the fancy club. Um, you know, I'm not going to have caviar because it seems like it's out of reach. And school sometimes is that way for young folks. And so like Shakira, we are about tearing down walls, opening up opportunity, engaging in conversation, and having young folks reimagine their relationship to subject areas that they've been pushed out of. Thanks so much for having me. And I can't wait to get to drinking. <laughs> yes, that is so awesome. And, you know, Chris is a professor at Columbia, and I have actually lectured in his class making parallels between wines and wrappers and how the nuances and specificities of the grapes are tied into the styles. So it, this is really about the collision of worlds. And then on top of that, Ariana is also our, our esteemed host from Paramount Caviar. We share something in common in that we are both two women in STEM technologies. We actually both work in tech. And there are some other tech folks on here too. Reggie, I see you. I knew that you are also tech. Carolyn is a scientist on here. Kiana is on here. So it's just this collaborative space of bringing together these things that are seemingly out of reach for other people. So Chris, thank you so much for being here. Erin, are we turning it over to Ariana now? Let's do that. I'll talk about Elena Rigato when we start talking about wine. All right. So Ariana, tell us a little bit about Paramount Caviar. Thank you everyone for having me. Happy 2021. Uh, Paramount Caviar was started in 1991 by my parents, Hussein and Amy Imani. Um, their marriage not only sparked the marriage between two wonderful people, but also two people who have very uh, distinct and very interesting backgrounds in food, uh, caviar, and luxury branding. So my father is from the Caspian region of northern Iran. So he grew up around the Caspian Sea. He grew up seeing sturgeons being uh, brought in from the Caspian Sea and also, of course, seeing the caviar being harvested. He grew up seeing those processes uh, really developed a love for the art and the science of it. Uh, and my mom has a really deep background in luxury branding, having worked as a national luxury brand manager for Neuchatel Chocolates and from Burger. Caviar to ensure the highest quality caviar was being um, 
you know, distributed throughout New York City and of course now all throughout the United States. And since then, uh, you know, we're coming up on 30 years uh, in April and we have had the absolute pleasure and privilege to be the caviar of choice for numerous uh, three-star uh, Michelin star restaurants within New York City, as well as other Michelin star restaurants, highly rated um, restaurant groups and uh, luxury hotel groups as well. And of course, you can also have our caviar at home. And um, you know, once again, thank you so much for having us. Um, this event is particularly momentous for us because we are very big advocates of education. We um, are huge advocates of education in that we want to ensure that people come in to our caviar vault and that they have the opportunity to learn all things about the science and the art of caviar because it truly does have um, a lot of really deep science in terms of um, sustainability, conservation, as well as even genetics research as well when you look at all the different types of sturgeon species um, and how they all differ from each other. And um, maybe one day we can have um, you know, a lecture specifically on you know, just the scientific properties of caviar itself but you know, we will we'll do that for another point. But um, anyway, we just wanted to thank you all for joining us, especially on a Sunday uh, in 2021. And we are very excited to get to know all of you and teach you all about caviar. Yeah, I just saw Jen and crew do a big cheers. And I saw Carolyn who her specialty is genetics get really excited <laughs> when you started talking about that. So that was awesome. Erin, um, tell us a little bit about Ole and Obrigado. Yes. So Orlando Rigado is an importer of artisanal wines from family farmers in Spain and Portugal. We actually just celebrated our 21st birthday last fall, so we we're very happy about that as an organization, and I'm very pleased that uh, we've got a bunch of my colleagues here today who are here to support and learn um, and represent, so thank you guys for being here. Um, any of them, if you have wine specific questions, you may see people answering in the chat if they've got a little Ole and Obrigado at the end of their name. You can trust that what they say is not BS. They, they're, they're here to support and help answer your questions too. So we, we are a wine importer, um, but so much of what we believe in and what we think about is ways of giving back. Um, thank you to Andrea. We, we, we just also received Importer of the Year from Wine and Spirits last fall, so we're feeling really happy and, and starting 2021, um, able to do even more of what we love, which is to talk to people, to communicate and to give back to our communities. So, you know, part of what Cava and Caviar, the way it got started was through what we call Ole and Obrigado Experiences, which is a new initiative that is all about getting people in their homes to sit and enjoy and talk about food and wine in a fun, easy, accessible way that always has some component of giving back to a great cause. So we've launched this series starting in September um, and we've partnered with a lot of great organizations and Cava and Caviar is now the first one that we're doing this year. This is the very first one we're doing in general and we're thrilled to be able to be raising funds for Hip Hop Ed today. We'll talk more about how you can donate more if you are so inclined after this. Um, but so much of what we do is, is just about connection and that's a big part of why we are here. Um, and we're so grateful. It's been a pleasure to work with Shakira as a, as a fellow uh, Spanish wine scholar and also just person who loves wine and, and loves to talk and get creative. So this has been great. Um, you can learn more about us on our website um, and more about experiences. We have a bunch of great ones coming up over the next few months that we think you will like, but we can talk about that later. Um, as far as the wines go, Navarone is one of our first wines that we ever imported. So they've been with us for this long ride and we're so happy to represent them and we'll talk about them when we get a little bit more into the wine stuff. So thank you. Awesome. So before we get into this, I want to talk a little bit about two things. One, what we're eating with this and two, Sparkling wine is always something that gives people a challenge to open. I see people terrified of it. If you watch me on some TV, you've seen several bottles explode on me. It happens. But there is an actual method to the madness of opening it, okay? So there's a cage on top. You want to keep your thumb on it at all times. This cage is screwed on. It's six turns to undo it. Two, three, four, five, six. Keeping your thumb on there, you want to turn the bottle and not the cork. You're not trying to pop the cork out. So if you just gently twist the bottle, you'll start to feel the tension. So you want to keep your thumb down and you should get that little sound. The wine should not spill out on you. This one is going to, I'm going to tell you now. 
because it wouldn't be it would be off brand for me if it didn't. Oh, okay. So there you go. <laughs> it did not blow up on me. Well, it's starting to do it, you see. But that is really the method to it. I know that the celebratory pop and spilling out all of this wine is a good idea. But when you're drinking good wine, you really don't want to spill or waste any of it. So that little quaint piff is what you're looking for when you open it. Before we get into this, I'm going to show you guys what I have eaten. So if you look at the little screen that's got, I think it says Shakira Jones too. Yes. So this is my plate in front of me. And I've gone a little bit classic and a little bit more uh, funky because caviar to me, and Ariana will get into this, it is a condiment. You can put it on lots of things. You can eat it by yourself. So here on my plate, I've got my caviar. And when you're eating it, you want to keep it cold. So there are beautiful uh, glasswares that you can buy that hold ice under it. Or you could take, this is really one of my glass prep bowls that I put some ice in and I set it on top of that. I've got some creme fraiche, some chives, uh, potato chips, which is my favorite thing to have caviar with. Here I've got some toasted brioche with a soft scrambled egg, some caviar on top and some chives. Uh, and these two are the, that beautiful sweet potato cake, the sweet potato latke recipe that you guys got. I've made those two. You can also enjoy this if you had French fries, whatever you would put a salty topping on, you can put caviar on. Just keep that in mind. And if you've got any unique ways or recipes that you've used caviar in, please use the chat and tell us. Okay, so we'll jump into caviar. So Ariana, Caviar, like most things in Europe, the naming conventions can be interesting, right? Caviar is not technically caviar unless it's what? Uh, so caviar is properly the cured roe of a sturgeon. So sturgeon are these prehistorical fish. We refer to it as a living fossil. The fish is mainly cartilaginous, so it's not, of course, very bony. Um, but the naming convention uh, goes to the actual species of the caviar, of the sturgeon itself. So when you see an Ocetra sturgeon or Ocetra caviar, it means it comes from the Ocetra species of the sturgeon itself. Savruga caviar comes from Savruga sturgeon. Um, and with paddlefish, which is what we are all having today, paddlefish is the closest cousin of the sturgeon. They are both part of the Acipensoriform order. So um, that shows the, the lineage there. They are, and paddlefish are the uh, only living cousin of sturgeons. There is another form, or there are other forms, but they have since gone extinct. So really it's the only living cousin that uh, sturgeons have. So technically, you know, if we wanna go to really proper science terms, um, the, we, we are having paddlefish roe, not so much paddlefish caviar, but it's a safe space. You are more than happy to call it paddlefish caviar. It's not a problem. But um, if you want to keep it to the science, caviar is the ro is the cured roe of a sturgeon. And that happens across the food and wine world, right? Yeah. All 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 cognac is brandy. All brandy is not cognac. Right. All champagne is sparkling wine. All sparkling wine is not champagne. So there's some confusion and nuances in those languages, but those are really just kind of almost social constructs of how these things are called. But scientifically or speaking from a method way, they are the same process, the same lineage of how they're being created. So these are domestically, this is our domestic paddlefish roe. This is farmed? Uh, this is not farmed. This it is uh, sustainably uh, caught. So these are wild paddlefish and they're sustainably caught. So um, caviar and a lot of fish roe are very much protected items because um, in the, you know, late 80s, early 90s, there were severe overfishing efforts in the Caspian Sea, which then led to a lot of the um, environmental consortiums in the United States to actually put an embargo on caviar from the Caspian Sea. So as a result of that, because we weren't getting caviar from the Caspian Sea region, whether it be from the Iranian region or from the Russian uh, side of the Caspian Sea, uh, the United States said, well, where do we get caviar? God, like, God forbid we have no caviar, what do we do? So they, they looked domestically and they said, well, we've got white sturgeon throughout California, throughout Tennessee, Mississippi River basins, and we also have paddlefish as well. Unfortunately, what that also led to was overfishing of those respective species. So there are really, really strict laws domestically as to how you can actually um, properly fish for 
in and for uh, paddlefish in and of itself. So all of, the, um, all of our domestic rows that we have at Paramount Caviar are um, sustainably fished. Um, we work with farmers, we work with fishermen that are very um, much with a clean record of having um, followed all of the FDA rules and CITES rules in terms of proper fishing strategies. That's wonderful to hear. And I think that, uh, you know, a part of the ecosystem of all these things, you know, wine is being severely impacted by things that human beings keep doing between global warming and the use of pesticides and things like that. The same thing is happening with fish and these things. So it's great to know that, you know, this is a product that's that's being sustainably farmed with the environment in mind. So one of the things that I think I hear most when people are kind of like, eh, about caviar is that they think, oh, I don't wanna eat fish eggs. It's gonna be fishy and gross and no. Debunk that myth for us. What should good caviar, like what we're eating now, most times there are differences between salty, buttery, those things. What are we looking for when we eat caviar? So the different properties and flavor profiles really depend on the species itself. But typically when you look for a good caviar, you want something that tastes very fresh with uh, that like hint of sea or ocean breeze uh, as what a lot of chefs like to say, like you should, it should, you know, get into your mouth and you should immediately think, wow, this is really fresh. Um, and depending on the species, it will have its own undertones. So for a lot of the domestic row that we have, like paddlefish, for example, um, you are going to get a little hint of um, like a like a watery flavor to it, but it should also be kind of creamy as well. If you go to a California white sturgeon, which is what we also have, that's going to be uh, very much of a uh, buttery and creamy undertone. So it really does depend on the species itself. Um, no caviar that you ever have, whether it be at Paramount, whether it be at you know any other brand, should ever taste fishy. It should never be overwhelmingly fishy. It should never taste overwhelmingly salty. Um, if it tastes too salty for you, then that means that whomever processed it added way too much salt. Um, so that is you know just a key. You should not have an overwhelmingly salty taste to it. And you know, also like when you look at the caviar, you should be able to discern every single pearl or, you know, the individual row itself. It should not look soupy. There, unfortunately, there are um, like you go on Instagram and you see, you know, people like posting about caviar and these are food experts, but you see that it looks really watery and it looks really soupy. That should never be the case. It should, you should be able to really discern every single row that is there. Um, and then, of course, you know, each species has its own categories of grading. At Paramount, we only uh, sell either the highest grade or the first, the highest and the second highest grades of each respective caviar, because for us, quality is key. If it doesn't hit our quality standards, we're not gonna sell it to you. So, um, you know, you should be really getting um, fresh flavor. Um, it should be, you know, not soupy. You should be able to discern every single row and it should not be overwhelmingly salty. I always say caviar is almost like salty tapioca. So even when you eat tapioca, what you love about it is that short little burst of sweetness that you get when you bite into one of the bubbles and that's what caviar should give you. So people have their preferences for like, these are relatively small row, which I think are delicious and great with, um, with potato chips, but there are also much bigger rows. And I, I think that in um, some of the specialty kits that Paramount offers, which I definitely will be ordering because I, I'm very excited about the stuff in Eric Repairs kit, um, you get the bigger eggs, which I think are delicious and really, really give you a flavor of the sea. So if you're somebody that likes Roy oysters because you love that brininess, that very much taste of the sea, when you start getting into the larger row, you get much more concentrated flavors of the sea that way. So if you like that, that is definitely something that you want to go into. Um, there are some questions here about sustainability because you can't harvest the eggs from the fish with the fish alive. Is that correct? Um, so they, I think they do some type of like a like an anesthetization process on the fish so that the fish isn't in harm and that also like the fish doesn't release um, like I guess like adrenaline, which potentially does affect the flavor of the row itself. So they, there is a, a very respectful way of actually cutting the fish and then, you know, therefore um, deplete and then therefore taking the caviar um, out of the fish itself. Um, fortunately, you know, that that is the last of the fish. And, you know, there are other ways that you can use the rest of the sturgeon. Um, the very traditional way in Northern Iran is that we used to make sturgeon kebab and it's very much like a 
mistakes. So, um, you know, you can have sturgeon meat. Uh, we've had hackleback sturgeon meat, you know, um, for a lot of holidays at, at our home and at Paramount Caviar as well. Um, but it's a very, um, res I, I would say it's a really respectful process. And, you know, again, when we work with sturgeon farms and when we work with fishermen, we really discern how they are treating the actual fish itself. Um, we see the conditions that, um, you know, they do the aquaculture farming in and there, there truly is a science behind it. And, um, you know, again, like this, it does go to that. These are critically endangered species and we need to protect them at all costs. And so how do we do that? We ensure that they're given really great conditions and that they're not mass produced. So if you do see, um, you know, some caviar producers and their price are super, that should be a red flag for you all because that means that they're mass producing and they're, they're probably to the high aquaculture standards and it does a lot of money to run a high end aquaculture. That should, you know, signal really big red flags for you ultimately. But yeah, yeah, that's typically that's what it is. For, in that case, you're right. In that, in that caviar, because of the care that is required to make it and to make it well, it is a luxury product in the sense that there's no uh, bargain caviar. If it's a bargain, you're going to get what you pay for. It's kind of like buying sushi at the local 7-Eleven, right? Is it edible? Maybe. Do you want to eat it? Probably not, right? No. So we are going to treat caviar in that sense as it is a luxury product, but it's because there's care taken in making it. It's no different than, you know, when we talk about charcuterie and those things, you know, if you get a piece of meat that's overly salted, even if it, or a codfish, you know, there are people from different backgrounds that eat cured fishes and cured meat. There's a very big difference between the preservation method of curing versus just over salting something to the point where it's inedible. And that can absolutely be an issue with caviar. The other thing is the texture. I have seen watery looking globby caviar. And please, if you ever see it, I don't care who's serving it to you, do not eat it. It will be a bad experience and it might turn you off forever from having caviar. Caviar is supposed to be light and buttery and delicious, not a soupy, fishy mess. All right, Ariana, thank you for that. So now let's get into the uh, another meshing of these beautiful worlds when we start talking about beautiful, beautiful kava. Erin, do you want to tell us a little bit about kava in general and about this producer? For sure. Thank you. I First of all, thank you, Ariana, because that was felt like a masterclass in 10 minutes about caviar, and now I'm completely obsessed. So I'm looking forward to also checking out more stuff from, from your site. Um, so as far as kava goes, kava is, is really Spain's answer to champagne. Um, and they used to be even less subtle about it. Um, a long time ago, people used to call it champagne um, in, in the Catalan language, just straight up saying, look, it's champagne. Um, but they got, they, got a num they got a nice letter from the French government eventually that says, no, 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 it, it's not champagne. Um, so the name was changed to kava, which is an homage to the cellaring um, and the aging process, these underground caves that you find close to the Mediterranean, um, which is essential to the development of creating a really good sparkling wine made in the Champagne method. Um, this producer is a, is a small producer. Uh, Navaran is an estate certified organic vintage grower producer. So they, they're in a very small box compared to the greater world of kava. And, and to keep it very brief about that, um, kava, is not just relegated to one small area around Barcelona anymore. Cava is now a style of wine made in the sparkling method. There are many rules, but it can actually be produced in seven different communities all across Spain. Some of them are as far west as Estremadura, which is next to Portugal. So the rules are getting a little weird. There's a lot of um, contention in the Cava community. Shakira and I were talking about that before this webinar started, um, just with different names and you might see Corpinat and people are leaving. Um, but the thing to know about this producer is they're solidly in the Peña Days area. Um, if you checked your email before this, I did send a slide deck. So there's a great map if you want to see where we are. Just go to Barcelona and drive 30 minutes west and that's where we're at in this part of the world. Um, that's the home of Cava. That's where our producers are. Um, and, and that's that. This is an estate that has been around since the 11th century, uh, so just a few years now, and they officially started as a winery in the late 1800s. The name of the place is Navaran, 
which is the name of the winery, which is the name of the wine. So keep it very streamlined in that regard. Um, and the winemaker is a guy named Michel Guillermo Periata de Navarone. Um, and he is the winemaker. He took over for his family property in 1985, uh, which was a great year for a lot of reasons. Um, <laughs> and we love his wines. And just as of last year, they officially finished their five year certification process to become organic um, certified in the US, which is a very grueling, invasive, long process. So we're so happy that they're able to do that. It really is a testament to the way that they produce their wine. They grow all of their own grapes. Not every sparkling wine producer, no matter where they are, does that. Um, so they're in a very special uh, niche box of being a grower producer. So they, they know the whole process. They know the ins and outs. And the three wines that we have today are great reflections. They're all really different in style. So maybe we can talk about that um, and answer some more questions about Cava. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I just want to give you guys a heads up. So 95% of the Cava on the market is from Pinedas, right? Like most cava that you'll ever drink is from this one particular region in Spain. Um, and although it's the exact same method, it is made the exact same way uh, that champagne is made. Champagne, if you've ever seen a map of it or attended a masterclass, it's cold. It is not a climate that you would think anything would grow well at all. Uh, whereas where most cava is produced, it's a very Mediterranean climate. It's close to the water, the grapes, have to struggle a lot less to grow and to be what they are. But the trio of grapes used, um, there are, oh, Erin will correct me on this. I think that there are six authorized white grapes, um, five or six authorized white grapes in, in this region that are allowed to be used. If it has the designation of cava, they are only allowed to, pr to produce and that means it specifically has Dio Cava on it. They can only make sparkling wines. They can't make any still wines. There are producers that make still wines, but they will not have the specific de designation of Cava because that designation says you can only make sparkling wines. Um, the other thing I wanted to add into this is that Spain is actually, they've really revolutionized this process. And if you know how champagne is made, really quick snapshot of this. So grape juice pressed, add yeast, yeast eats sugar, yeast dies, yeast is still in the bottle dead. You have to slowly rotate the bottle in increments to bring all the dead yeast up to the top of the bottle. Spain is actually credited with mechanizing that process. Otherwise, literally, it was somebody's job, it still is a lot of people's job in Champagne, France, to walk and hand turn bottles. Um, and it is a grueling process. If you ever get to see people do this, they are like wizards, but it's much quicker to be done by a machine. So those are really some of the, the, the biggest difference, even though it's the same method, the climates where, between Champagne and Cava are extremely different and the grapes used are different. Those are the major things. And that ends up giving you a different taste in the glass. Cava tends to be a lot less acidic um, than Champagne or Cremant. To me, it's a gift and a curse. I mean, for those that like acid, sometimes I prefer champagne to cava, but as far as not overpowering the foods that you're having it with, cava is actually the easier wine to pair with your food. And I find to be quite versatile sometimes and it's cheaper, so why not? All right, Erin, you wanna talk a little bit about us. Which one are you drinking actually? Which one are most of you guys drinking? Which, which uh, put it in the chat if you have the wines, which one you decided to open first if you have, oh, does someone have the rosé? I see it, wonderful. I like that. Nice, okay, so a lot of us are drinking the same thing, which is great. Erin uh, and I, I think we both went for the Brut Natur. Um, these have, so just like champagne, Cava has different sweetness levels uh, that can kind of tell you what you're gonna get in the bottle. It is, um, Almost a shame is champagne, but not Brut Natur having the least sugar and uh, what is it? Dolce having the most. And in between there, you've got Secco, Extra Secco, Brut, Secco. Extra Brut. <laughs> There's a lot. It's basically just, uh, it's for the consumer. It's to tell you how much sugar is potentially in your wine. So if you are somebody that likes your wine still with a little bit of sweetness, you're going to be, Dolce is really, really sweet really sweet. Um, and then as you go up, you get a little bit less sugar. But if you like sugar, there are a lot of great Seco Cava's that, that are really good. 
All right, Erin, take us back to what we're drinking now. Sure. So Navran is a is a producer that really wants to show off the the grapes that they grow, which are exceptionally high quality. And one of the things I like is that they offer a brute vintage, which is the majority of sparkling wines are going to be brute. Um, and brute is a big window, right? It's from basically zero to 12 grams of residual sugar per liter. So you can have a brute in your life that to your taste is bone dry and really kind of gives you that searing acid on the side of your palate, or you can have a brute where you're picking up some flavors of sweetness. It's hard to know. Um, this producer, their brute is pretty solidly in the middle of residual sugar, about six grams. So you're not going to pick up tasting sweetness, but it's not such an austere experience on the palate. Um, the wine I'm drinking right now, because I don't drink it quite as often, is the Brut Nature. And like Shakira was just saying, Brut Nature is going to be the most dry um, style of, of sparkling wine and looking at a window between zero and three grams per liter. Um, Brut Nature can sometimes be a little bit, a little, a little severe, if especially if you've I don't know, just brush your teeth or it's the first wine you're tasting or if you don't have food. That being said, I do have food. I decided to prepare a tortilla espanola or tortilla de patatas, if you're familiar, which is a really actually labor intensive dish. So I did the Ferran Adria cheat shortcut, which is where you make it with potato chips. You literally just crush a bag of potato chips, the thinner the better, um, and you mix them with the eggs and you cook it like you would a regular tortilla. So it's done in a fraction of the time. It's very delicious and it's amazing with a little bit of caviar and certainly with some kava. The Brut Nature here is, has a little bit more of a grape called Macabeo in it, which is a grape that on its own is fruitier. It's a little more generous. It's kind of like the golden retriever of, of the kava grape world. It's friendly, it's approachable, it, it wants to love you. Um, and so, offsetting that really dry style is a grape that's a bit more fruity and, and a bit more fun and approachable. The, the Brut Vintage, um, which is what I would recommend tasting next, first, it's okay, it's okay to taste them all um, in different order. The Brut Vintage is based in a grape called Charello, which is the grape of, that's the most mineral expression of cava. This part of Spain used to be covered by the ocean, um, so what we have is marine seabed which again, for me, is why drinking kava with seafood is the most naturally, I mean, Ariana was saying sturgeon are living fossils. Well, in the vineyards in the kava part of Spain, we have dead fossils. <laughs> We've got, you know, crustaceans and mollusks and all of these things that are typical of calcareous soil that has been under the sea. And all of that brings a natural salinity and thus a natural ability to pair with seafood and anything that comes from the sea into the wines and, and gives it a little bit of life and a little bit of pop in the palate. Um, in general, in my experience, kava tends to be a little drier than some other sparkling wines. Like if you like Prosecco, which tends to be a bit fruitier, a bit more residual sugar, kava is usually a bit drier than that. And I love it with, I mean, salty things, French fries, French fries and a glass of kava is a pretty typical experience in my life. Um, and Navaran really, because of their emphasis on growing high quality grapes, they are very, very confident that their blends, the decisions that they make are respective to the residual sugar that's in the wines. It makes sense to them. One thing I think is really fun about this producer is that one of the main grapes in Cava is called Periata, and it's named for this family. Um, the Periata family are the family who make this wine. Periata is a grape that used to be in France that was brought to Spain by this family. So there's a long history here, and I can't really think of much more credentials you can get in making kava than if one of the grapes that everybody else uses is literally your last name. <laughs> so that's a fun fact about these people. And you'd see that Laura put a link in, you can learn more about the, the wines itself. Um, I don't know if we want to talk about the Dama a little bit in case anybody has it. I think a lot of people- Does anyone have, have the Dama or are we the only two? So the Dama is this Beautiful. This is, it's the, the black bottle. It's really dark brown bottle. But this is actually the first time I'm having a Chardonnay dominant cava, which is really interesting to me because, oh, I should probably finish this first. Because Chardonnay is an authorized grape um, to be used in the production of cava, but it isn't one that is very common. Um, most blends that you'll find kind of like the trio in Champagne, it's going to be Meunier, Chardonnay, and Pinot Noir. When it comes to cava, it's going to be Macabeo, Chorello, and Ferreira. So 
to have something like Chardonnay. And I'm surprised that they didn't use Macabeo, the pretty girl uh, in the blend and that they chose to use Paralada, but having it be the family namesake grape, it makes total sense that they wouldn't have used any other grape than that. Um, but I think that that'll be an interesting one to try. And one other thing that I wanted to mention about Cava, in addition to the salinity, just because of where it's from, I find that Cava always has a beautiful like herbaceous greenness to it. So I actually like kava with salads or vegetable dishes too. So if you're vegetarian or you're vegan, um, because of the lower acidity and like the, the brightness and the freshness of it and that little hint of salt and that little hint of greenness, I actually think kava works very well with a lot of vegetable dishes in addition to seafood. So if you are somebody that is vegetarian or vegan or pescatarian, kava is really um, something that you want to explore and get into because it's, it's really, really an easy pairing with that. The only other thing I wanted to point out before we talk a little more specifically about this wine, if you look at this bottle, it's got this little sticker on here. Uh, the wine laws in Spain, for some reason, they want to make it just as complicated as France. Um, <laughs> I don't know why, because it was much easier to study having not having to remember the specificity of it. But it's really about protecting the consumer. And so that when you buy something with this denomination on there, you know exactly what you're getting. So all three of these bottles, this is a symbol saying that all of these wines have spent at least nine months surly. Surly is a wine word and it really means on the lees. So remember when I gave that quick 101 about winemaking, about sugar, you adding yeast, it eating sugar, like overeating sugar, like at a Vegas buffet eating sugar and then dies. When you leave the wine on that dead leaf, it, it develops this texture to it. And Shirello as a grape naturally brings that, but the longer you leave the wine on the leaves, the more rich and the more depth the wine develops. So the DO of Cava has decided they have, just like if you drink Rioja, they've got Reserva, they've got Gran Reserva, and now they've in 2015 developed this other um, designation that Erin and I are still trying to study and wrap our brain around because it's quite challenging. But these stickers on these indicate that the wines have spent at least nine months aging on the leaves. And ironically, with all of these, the two, um, the Dama is 24 months and the other two are 18 months. So even though the requirement is only nine months, these wines have actually spent double the amount of time on the leaves. So you're getting exceptional quality in these wines. That is one thing we'll have to do about the session. Oh, go ahead. I, I said we'll need a whole extra session to study the, the new rules of Kava, but please continue to tell us about these. This producer, and this will explain the Chardonnay uh, point that you brought up about the Dama. In some ways, this producer really is paying, paying homage to grower champagne. And so when we talk about the, the minimums that the Kava deal requires, nine months, which is, it's above, it's above and beyond a lot of other places, they're not interested in just meeting that mark and that's it and, and kind of walking away and packaging something. They really want to meet and or exceed the same regulations that are applied to traditional champagnes. So the Brut Vintage, the Brut Nature, and the Rosé, if any of you have it, are going to be at least 12 months. Often we're looking closer to 18 months, um, but it is dependent on the vintage on the lees. So more complexity with every month that goes by, and that's going to ultimately give you a really, you know, a gastronomic wine, a wine that gives you something more than just fizz and acid and fruit. Um, as far as the Dama goes, that is a longer, a longer elevage, a longer aging, and it is mostly Chardonnay, which is very weird uh, for Cava, even though it is allowed. So this producer, Navarone, was one of the one of the early pioneers of planting two of those main champagne varieties in the Penedès region, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. So if you do have the rosé, it's Pinot Noir based, which is not always the case with other rosé cavas. And then of course the Dama is sort of in its own special world. It's why it's in a differently shaped bottle. If you see, it reminds me of, uh, of special club champagne bottles a little bit. I think there's a clear nod, little tip of the hat there, um, but it's 85% Chardonnay. And then the rest is Periata, which Shakira nailed it. I mean, that's their flagship grape in some ways because it's the family name 
Uh, the best way I ever heard someone describe periata is periata as a grape. What it does in the blend is it's the eyeliner. So it really makes the other grapes pop. Doesn't do a whole ton on itself, but it's that's the eyeliner. So I appreciate that, especially being on these Zoom calls all the time. Sometimes that's what you need. Um, so it's not that's I, all you get. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that might be all you get. Um, you know, I think that as you explore wine, one of the one of the reasons I've fallen in love with Spain is that I find that the wines are made with so much care. And these families that are making these wine stills have been making wine for centuries. They care about what's in the bottle. They care about what they're delivering to you. But the price point is so much lower. You can drink from all over Spain for a fraction of the cost. I'm not telling you not to drink French wine. I'm certainly not telling you not to drink grower champagne because God knows I would be the biggest liar ever if I told you not to do that. But I want you to get more excited about Cava because there are so many different blends. I mean, I think that the the Brut Nature is more Macabeo than anything. And I tend to like Shirello based, Shirello dominant um, Cavas. Oh, by the way, that X, X A R E L dot R O, that grape is pronounced Shirello. Um, working in the wine shop, I have really tried to pity people that have tried to say that word like it's something else. Nope, it's just Shirello. Easy peasy. Um, but Shirello is also, just as a tidbit, it is one of the few still wines from this region that are absolutely delicious. So if you enjoy Chardonnay, if you enjoy oak Chardonnay, if you enjoy white Burgundy, you should actually try to seek out a still Shirello. They are absolutely delicious. I think we've got a couple questions about food pairing. So I'd love to hear, I mean, I know Ariana has the wines. I know Dr. Emden, you have the wines and some food I think in front of you. And of course Shakira gave us this tour of her beautiful <laughs> setup. So I'm curious how everything's pairing and we want to see what you made too, uh, if you did if you did cook something. So let's, let's talk about that. Yeah, and if you've got any questions, please. I mean, just from my side, um, my bagel with lox, creme fraiche, and the paddlefish is not the most aesthetically pleasing, and everything is so beautiful, so I won't, you know, force people to see it, but I really like the paddlefish with the Brut Netro. I think that was a really nice pairing. Um, historically, you'll see a lot of pairings of caviar with vodka, especially in the Russian community or the former USSR communities, um, champagne, of course, you know, champagne and caviar dreams. And then now uh, kava is a really big um, pairing that's coming up with caviar. Um, each country wants to sell their products. So that's why you'll see a lot of the Russian stores selling the vodka caviar pairing, champagne, champagne caviar pairing, X, Y, and Z. Um, it really does depend on your preference and ultimately how you, you know, just want to enjoy um, your food and drinks. I'm a purist and I choose to go with like the old school Persian way, which is um, having the caviar with a little bit of dark tea on the side. That's how my grandparents had it. That's how their parents had it. Um, that's just me being a purist. But in today's um, talk, I really like the Brut Nature Vintage. I thought it, the um, dryness really paired well with the paddlefish caviar. It was a nice contrast between the dry and the like that creamy ocean um, taste that you'll typically get with a paddlefish caviar. And of course, um, you know, different caviars in our line will pair differently with different types of um, wines itself, like a Siberian caviar, will, which is typically known for its briny undertones, may actually also go well with a Brunetra vintage, um, but something with a little bit more acidity to, you know, really counteract that brininess flavor. Yeah, Kelly mentioned that she's having it with scrambled eggs. That's my little, that is one of my favorite ways to enjoy caviar is on top of a, a, a nice soft scramble. It's absolutely delicious. Um, one of the things I wanted you to touch on a little bit, Ariana, is one, what, if you ordered the caviar, you got this beautiful mother of pearl spoon with it, um, which are super fancy and super delicate. And there is a reason for that. Now, you could use plastic too, but you absolutely cannot use metal. Why? Uh, the, the, the taste of the caviar is very delicate and we want you to really maximize the amount of that flavor that you 
eventually consume. A metallic spoon will bear too much of a metallic taste and it will actually confuse your palate. So we always recommend that you have the caviar with a non, um, I don't want to say flavor bearing spoon, but just something. It's not reactive, yeah. right? So you can use plastic. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So you, I mean, you can have it with plastic that, that works too. You can even have it with a baby spoon. If, yeah. if you run out and you're, you just have baby spoons around that works too. Um, but definitely, you know, mother of pearl is that it also adds to the experience of it all. If you just want to have like a Lux night for you and, and your, uh, and your significant other, you know, the mother of pearl spoon and plate combination really does go well with the caviar, but something that won't impose uh, a taste on the caviar is really what you want to aim for. Plastic is more than okay. Um, and of course, mother of pearl is the, the ultimate. Yeah, that's experience. the business. Also, we're talking about food pairings, but I would be a full liar and Ebony has done this with me. I will happily just eat caviar out the container. It's quite delicious, especially if you have the right wine. You really don't need anything with it. I actually tried to feed caviar to a seven-year-old um, who did not enjoy it and was quite honest in saying she did not enjoy it, but she didn't hate it. Right. So I'm going to try again uh, a little bit later. And I want you to try that. Even if you've never had caviar before, have it on something you like. I've put caviar on fried chicken, anything that you would add a salty or buttery or rich component to, caviar will go well with it. And you don't have to start by spending a lot of money. Definitely, it's, a, it's again, it's a luxe night, but spend 50, 60, $70 and treat yourself to it. It's delicious. And it's something that it's a conversation starter. When the world opens again and we can go to parties, I promise you it's the best party ever, even if the party sucks. If they've got a lot of caviar and champagne there, you're gonna have a great time. Um, and it's also just a palate developer. And I wanted to touch on one more thing with these wines about the difference between them and champagne sometimes, because I think that that's how a lot of people um, go into enjoying or not enjoying other sparkling wines is that they immediately want to compare it to champagne. Champagne is a place. Champagne uses specific grapes and a specific method to produce a specific wine. Cava is the same method, but the grapes are different. The climate's different. The soil is different. So it's not meant to taste like champagne. It's meant to taste like its own thing. So the first thing that you'll notice is the mousse or the bubbles. Normally when you pour a glass of champagne, there's just a flush of bubbles coming all the way up consistently. You won't find that in many cavas. Cavas are much more subdued. It's the more elegant lady of the party, right? She comes in, she fizzes up in the glass and then she relaxes. She sits on the side and does her things. She's cute. She mixes well with everybody, but she doesn't need a lot of the fanfare. That's what kava gives you. And to me, I very much enjoy that sometimes. It's low alcohol. Well, my parents are gonna look at me crazy. It's relatively low alcohol <laughs> because it's normally around yeah, 11 and a half to 13% is kind of where kava sits. So you can enjoy quite a bit of it, uh, much like champagne. And I, I don't want you to add orange juice to this. If you want to make a mimosa, by all means, get some Prosecco and make the best mimosas that you can. But uh, when it comes to champagne and kava, I don't want you to pour juice in this. I want you to enjoy this as is. Um, but guys, are there any questions? Can you comment on why you're serving your kava in a regular wine glass, just as I am? Yes, so I do not like flutes very much, only because of how I drink wine and how I encourage you to drink wine where you can actually experience it. So for me, I like my sparkling wines in a white wine glass so that I can get my nose in it and pick up on these flavors. So funny enough on this, um, I mean, this smells like Chardonnay, right? This is deliciously Chardonnay. It's citrus, it's stone fruit. It's just lovely. And, and you get to open up the wines and get the aromatics. Could you drink it out of a flute? Yes. Those are the only potato chips I want to see people eating. Those lovely organic kettle brown bag potato chips. Um, you could enjoy it in a flute. Listen, I'm saying this stuff all is how I enjoy things. If you want to have a mimosa with this delicious kava, so be it. Just promise me you're gonna have one glass by itself before you pour the orange juice in it. That's all I'm asking. Just one glass by itself. 
one. Uh, but absolutely, this is all meant for you to enjoy it the way you are. And these kavas, again, the main reason I want people drinking more of them, they're super affordable. I mean, again, this family is named, like they are the grape. This grape is considered a native Spanish grape, which it actually isn't. But almost every kava that you will ever drink has this grape in it. This family made it. And these wines are all under the price that I would ever tell you to buy a bottle of champagne for, right? So you're getting superior quality, a legacy of great winemaking for a fraction of the price of what you would spend on other things. Am I telling you not to drink champagne? No, I'm not telling you not to drink champagne. I'm actually encouraging you to drink champagne, but I'm also encouraging you to drink kava and enjoy it. Um, are there any questions? I want to hear you guys talk. Like, let's step out of the chat and let's talk. If, did you guys learn anything cool about caviar that would make you more inclined to tasting it now if you haven't had it before? Talk to me. So I'll start. Yeah, I'll start. Um, this is just, just good. Um, I, I'm having a ball here. And so I'm going to kind of showcase what we're having. I'll move my camera a little bit. So we have... Um, we have like scrambled eggs. I don't know if you guys can see. Yep, you can't. Mm -hmm. So scrambled eggs. Yum. With, with caviar, it's super, super good. And then we also have like. Um, this is a wheat toast with lox, creme fraiche, and also um, caviar. Perfect. It, it is absolutely delicious, but and like, oh, I'm sorry. Yo, she, she's um, really going ham. And then so. we have potato chips. Prim fresh and caviar, and it's amazing too. So all, all of it is delicious, but but that that um. So I'm gonna get real hood real quick, right? Like that 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 brute in the chore joint with the with the with the chips. Fire, fire, fire son. Fire. Like fire. that's fire. the one. And then I also say this, right? Because some folks may have more sophisticated palates than others. Like you know, I, like like my my partner is the more sophisticated of the two of us, right? And so when she indulges, I'm often like, there she goes again. <laughs> um, and in this instance, I actually sat with and tried to off the hook. So I'm having a ball. And I've also learned so much just beyond just the, the drinking. I'll just share a few of those things and then I'll pass it off. First thing is like the French government being so gangster, like, nah, you can't name that. Um, champagne <laughs> is sick. Um, but I also appreciate fine, we'll just call it kava and it's just as good. Like that works for me as well. Um, and then I like I, I, I was also really curious about Ariana's description about the pairing of the caviar with the tea. So my parents are Caribbean mm -hmm. and so tea is life. And so you, you mentioned dark teas that you pair. Are there any more details about what dark teas? So um, old school Iranian tea is a black tea, pretty similar to like an Earl Grey, but we also add a little bit of cardamom to it. So if you've ever gone to a Middle Eastern restaurant, you've likely, and you've had dessert at a Middle Eastern restaurant, you've likely had either a mint tea or the dark tea with a little bit of cardamom in it. Cardamom in it. The latter is the more traditional Iranian tea. That's typically how my grandparents had it. Um, so I have a little bit of nostalgia and like, you know, when my dad took me to Iran, that's how we, we had, you know, caviar. We would go to the Caspian Sea, they would sell it, and then we would bring it back home. And that's how we had it with our, with my grandfather. Um, so the traditional tea is, it's a black tea. Go for like an Earl Grey. Um, you don't want too much flavor added because the caviar itself already has a good amount of flavor. So I would say a black tea with a little bit of like an Earl Grey feel is, is perfect. If you want to experiment and go for a slight cardamom, um, that also works too, just so, you know, and I say that just from my experience, of course, I would love to hear what types of teas that you guys have in the Caribbean um, and, you know, how you eventually eat it. But um, that's at least how the, the old school Iranians used to have it. We're British colonies. We're going to have it with Earl Grey. Yeah, uh, there is. Thank you. Yes, that's how we did it too. That because the British were in Iran for some time, and when they left, they didn't take their tea with them, and we ended up having more of their tea, and so that's just how it ended. It ended. Totally fine. I want to point out something though. So Ebony and I, Ebony is my greatest wine. If ever there was a great wine student in the world, it's Ebony. When I met Ebony many, many moons ago, <laughs> her and Chris were just married and she drank jam jar. I'm pretty sure that if I gave Ebony jam jar right now, she'd spit it out everywhere. 
But I'm laughing because Chris was so opposed to eating caviar. The many times we've had caviar around him, he has been completely opposed to even tasting it. So watching him enjoy it today and learn and, and really dive into it and lean into it has just been dope. I just want to point that out that it's dope. This, my, my parents had caviar for the first time over Christmas break this year when I was home and they both loved it. So I am here for this caviar culture movement with other people diving into it. Um, guys, what else? Who else? I, I, Kiana, you are pouring and pouring and pouring and I'm loving it. <laughs> I know, I can't- I'll chime in real quick. Oh, go ahead. No, no, no. I was just saying I, I'm, I'm going to town on, on the Brutney tour here. Love it. Larissa, where are we at? <laughs> so I was trying to keep it cute and just open one bottle, but <laughs> so much about the Brutney tour. I'm like, OK, now I got to open this up. Like, I've learned so much. So me, I, too, am a caviar novice. Like, I have my wine sisters, Julia, Shakira, and Kelly, who always talk about, you know, pairing sparkling wine with caviar. And I was like, yeah, I mean, OK. But today was just such a great day to try something new and really, like, I feel fancy AF. <laughs> like with my shell spoon and my creme fraiche and my, my organic potato chips and yes. a little French onion, um, little powder in the creme fraiche that you've talked about. I got that gem right there. Game changer. <laughs> you're, you're experiencing the other level. So I have this thing where I, I always use the same Vermont Creamery Creme Fresh because I love it and I think it's delicious. If you get a little packet of Lipton onion soup and add just a little bit of that into your Creme Fresh, like this experience goes from, from, it's already up here, but it goes to like up here, just a little bit of it. It is so delicious. It adds like this very um, oniony, but almost sweet flavor to it that is just, freaking phenomenal. Also, I know, so Carolyn is, is my aunt and I know that she is vegan. If you try this with the vegan sour cream, it works just as well as creme fraiche. So you too can indulge in this. Oh, but you can't actually eat caviar, can you? Got it. All right. All right. We'll work on some more ideas for this. Uh, Kelly says this tastes like the caviar at Bergdorf. Yes, it does. Um, is it your caviar there? Yes, it is. There's a reason why. Um, yeah, that is our caviar at uh, Goodman's Bar. So if you went to Goodman's, I don't know if the bar is still open. Thank you, COVID. But yes, that is that is very much our caviar. I don't know if they have the paddlefish caviar, but I think they have um, a couple of our imported caviars. But yes, and, and very good. If, if you were able to catch on to that, then yes, that is very much our caviar. We were at that event, and I think that was probably one of the last events that I ever went to with makeup and a full outfit on before COVID happened. Okay, so, so I was there too. There it is. <laughs> we didn't run into each other, but that was one of the last outside events I did too. Kelly yes. and I absolutely had great nights sitting at uh, the bar at Goodman's. When the world opens again, if you are in New York City, in the in the men's shop of Bergdorf Goodman on the second, no, it's on the third floor. Yeah. There is very cute, like vintage, amazing bar there where you could have ordered this amazing plate of chips uh, and, and crumb fresh and caviar that was just like the ultimate indulgence after a long day of work. Wasn't very expensive at all, but it was delicious. Um, if you are super luxe and you have ever been to uh, La Berna Den, which is a three-star Michelin restaurant here, um, chef repair, who I can't wait to have on the podcast, just saying if you're a subscriber. Um, he actually has a line with you guys, and that is some of the best caviar that, I mean, every dish at La Berna Den, which is a seafood focused restaurant, is just phenomenal. So if you haven't heard about Paramount yet and you're looking to try caviars, you can go to their, um, on their Instagram page, there's a thing right there where you can reserve through Talk. If you are local, you can reserve to pick it up Monday through Friday. If not, you can order and taste through this. Um, you can order with shipping through them. So there's a great way and there are different price points where you can really dive into this stuff and taste and learn. This is definitely something that is enjoyable when it's shared with other people. You don't need a lot of it unless you're eating with me, then you probably need a lot of it because I like a lot of it. But if you are just getting into it, get yourself a small tin, make that your self-care moment and dive in. And you know what? We've had it with Kava. If you like other styles of sparkling wine, Cremant, 
champagne. Dive in, try it. Try it with different things and see what you actually like. This is, if you, this is a very good value, by the way, because most tins, thank you for pointing that out, Kelly, are a little flat disc of 30 grams for almost $100. So this is a super, super good deal and it's delicious. It's buttery, it's like, I have been shamelessly off camera, like scarfing down spoonfuls of it at a time. I don't know if anyone has caught me, um, but I have because it's just delicious. I, I can't eat enough of it, I'm sorry. What else? Who I see parties going on. I see kids at the table, which I love. I also wanted to capitalize on the children piece of this because one thing that differentiates caviar from cava, champagne, and all the other delicious um, drinks that we like to have is that caviar is safe to consume for women who are expecting or are nursing. So if you are expecting and if you are nursing, and I do see a very newborn baby, congratulations. Yes, um, that Yes, congratulations, mazel tov. Uh, you can have caviar while you are nursing. Uh, it is safe for you to eat and your baby can also have caviar. And I say that because I shame, no, no shame. I was one who had caviar growing up. And there are photos of me on the table with my dad being spoon fed caviar. I don't tell that to a lot of people, but I feel so comfortable speaking with all of you. But I will say that is one of the main differentiators is that, you know, for breastfeeding moms, expecting moms, please go ahead, please treat yourself to a little bit of caviar. Um, it's mostly proteins and really good cholesterol. So, you know, feel free to indulge. And then also for uh, your little ones, um, yes, they can have caviar. Um, and, you know, we are, we sell our caviar at a really affordable price point. Our goal is that, you know, caviar should not be so exorbitant that you're wondering what you actually paid for, but um, it's also not so inexpensive where you wonder, you know, am I compromising on quality? Every caviar that you see at Paramount is at the first or second grades of the respective species bearing. Um, and so just depending on your price point, just choose one of the caviars and I promise you it will be a really delicious and wonderful experience for you and your children to have as well. So, um, and we also love meeting the next generation of caviar lovers as well. I'm working on Sydney. She's going to get into it. She was, she was, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna repost the video of her trying because yes. it was the cutest thing ever. Cause she tried her best, she did. And then she was very proud of herself that she tried the caviar thing. That's all you need. Just let them come to that aha moment on their own. It took me a bit, like I, I was fed it when I was little and then I went through a stage where I'm like, no, I'm not gonna eat that. I'm sorry, it's not gonna happen. And then some way, somehow my taste buds, you know, came back to its senses and it said, no, this is, this is good stuff. And so here I am, but yeah, just let her, you know, let her have that aha moment. Let all of your kids have that aha moment. Just get them to be very experimental eaters um, and also just teach them to enjoy quality, quality food and quality dining. Yes, absolutely. We are a little bit past two o'clock. We're having so much fun here, but I want to be respectful of everybody's time. If it is past the time and you need to leave us, thank you so very much for joining us. Um, I want to thank our host, uh, Aaron from, and the entire Olio Brigado family, uh, and Ariana from Paramount Caviar, Dr. Christopher Emden from uh, Hip Hop Ed. I want to thank everyone for being here. I hope that you learned something, that you had a good time. If you are so inclined and you would like to continue to donate to this amazing organization, um, the Eventbrite link, the link that you actually um, uh, signed up for this event to is still open for donations. So you can go there and do donations. If you want to learn more about Hip Hop Ed, you can go to their website and visit the great work that they're doing. Of course, our annual conference is going to be a little different this year considering COVID, which is still here, um, but the work is still being done. And so I wanna make sure that you guys, you know, check out our sites. Um, Olio Brigado imports some of the best wines. If you follow me on social media, you know that I am in love with many of their wines. I think that what they bring to the country um, are some of the best that Spain and Portugal have to offer. I think that the Iberian Peninsula is the most underrated wine region in the world because there are incredible wines there. So please follow them. They also, not only in doing this event to support Hip Hop Ed, they've got Liquid Geography that they also have a rosé that has been benefiting a project for the South South Bronx. So their commitment to engaging in community work 
is nothing new. It's, it's not a post George Floyd situation. They have been about this and it is why I did not hesitate for a second to partner with them and, and bring you guys this experience, which I really, really hope that you enjoyed. Ariana, I think you have some new Caviar fans now, for sure. There are some people asking if this package is still available. I'm not sure that it is, um, but direct people to the website. Yeah. So. Um all of the items that you had today are available on our site. So you can go to paramountcaviar.com. You can see our paddlefish row in the domestic uh, caviar tab and you can have our smoked salmon. It's the same smoked salmon that you had today. It's the same thing. It's all from our house. Um, you can have the smoked salmon and you can order yourself a creme fraiche. And if you also want to add to your mother of pearl spoon collection, we have a series of mother of pearl spoons that we have as well. So feel free to go on our site. And Ebony's smiling. Chris, just know you're about to have to buy her a set of mother of pearl spoons. That's all. Just, it's a thing now. It's going to be a family heirloom. It's fine. Um, but thank you guys so, so much for being here. If you're still hanging out and want to talk a little bit more, or you didn't get to ask your questions about the wines, I'm happy to hang out for a couple more minutes. If not, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for bringing in the first Sunday of the new year uh, with us. I really hope that you enjoyed these wines, and I am looking forward in 2021 to bringing you more of these experiences along with our partners here. Um, you know, there are opportunities, especially through um, uh, Paramount Caviar, they have virtual tasting things set up. If you wanted to set up a class and get a little bit more in depth into learning the science of caviar and, and learning more detail, that's available. We are going to talk offline because Chris, I think there is an opportunity once the world is back to normal to introduce this to kids. So we can bring in Sarah Thomas from Kalamata and really create a kid-centric thing about this and start them very young. Um, Sarah's a great friend and I'm sure she would be super excited. And I know a couple people on here with little ones that we would be happy to kind of do a kid-friendly introduction into this too. Um, but thank you, thank you, thank you. And cheers to a much better 2021. <laughs> 2020 was a doozy, but here we are in 2021 thriving and surviving, eating caviar and drinking beautiful uh, sparkling wine. So cheers to you all. And thank you so, so much for joining us. Thank you. You have been the most incredible host period ever. And I just wanted to say that we just had a lot of aha moments. I had dozens, if not hundreds myself. Every kid deserves to have aha moments. And that is why the work of hip hop ed is so important. So please go back to that link, add an extra donation, fund the future of STEM, bring those aha moments to, to kids that they're working with in New York and hopefully maybe someday beyond. And thank you all for being here. And thank you, Shakira. Thank you, Ariana. Thank you, Papa. Cheers and happy new year. We're going to hang out. I'm going to stop recording this. Yeah. And if you're interested in my wine recommendations, you can.